Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Uh, this is Firoz Manji from Daraja Press, uh, and welcome to Organizing in the Time of COVID. I hope you are all well and keeping safe in these troubled times. Uh, today we have four, we have three very, very interesting guests. Um, some of you may have may have heard uh, about the uh, declaration. Uh, by African intellectuals uh, are about the COVID crisis. And uh, the three initiators of this uh, amazing declaration, which has now been signed by numerous intellectuals, uh, and many, many famous and many infamous, uh, like myself, infamous. Um, and uh, uh, and so I want to welcome uh, three guests. That we, we have uh, Dr. Dongo Sambasila, uh, is a Senegalese development economist, and he's worked uh, previously as a technical advisor uh, at the presidency of the Republic of Senegal. Um, he's currently a research and program manager at the West Africa office of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Dakar. Uh, he has been prolific in terms of the work uh, he has published and, and, the, and the scope that he has uh, covered uh, on fair trade, labor markets in developing countries, social movements, uh, democratic theory, uh, economic and monetary sovereignty, uh, as well as other books that he has, has, has published. Um, I think one. Uh, I think we have a team here uh, who are amongst the most creative thinkers uh, that I know, and and so I I think this is going to be a really interesting uh, um, uh, program today. Uh, our second guest is is Amy Young, uh, who is an academic and writer. She teaches uh, international relations at the University of Witwatersrand. Uh, Witz University. She is the author of The Post-Colonial African State in Transition, Stateness and the Modes of Sovereignty, which was published by Ronan Littlefield in 2018. And thirdly, uh, is uh, but not last, not least, is Lionel uh, Zivonu, uh, who is a, an Associate Professor of Public Law at the University of, of Paris, uh, Nanterre. He teaches uh, European administration law, economic law, administrative law, and public administration. His uh, thesis uh, concerns European competition law and legal uh, theory from the critical point of view. Uh, since 2018, he has been appointed for five years at the Institut Universitaire de France. He is now working on the relationship between race and law, particularly the tensions generated by the universalist claim for French law and colonial domination through the category of assimilation. I really look forward to, to, to reading that. Uh, so uh, uh, a, a, a very, very warm welcome to, uh, to all of you. Thank you for joining us on this show. Thank um, you. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Um, just so that uh, we'll be talking about um, the, uh, the the declaration which uh, was produced, uh, and uh, just for people to know, you can see it's been published so many places. But on Algiers, uh, Al Jazeera, you, this is the URL that you can see it uh, see it on, um, and. Uh, um, for those who may be uh, be be interested, uh, this is the the declaration which we will be uh, discussing. Um, I, I think uh, a, a very important uh, declaration that came out. So, um, so the, I mean, the, the first question I mean it's the obvious one, isn't it? It's um, why why did you decide to uh, produce this declaration? Who would like to take that on? Lionel, how about you? Oh, um, I think that this, this statement came almost spontaneously. Um, when awareness of the effects of COVID-19 began to emerge, we therefore decided to include 
several um, French speaking, English speaking, Arabic speaking, Portuguese speaking colleagues, in short, form all cultural area of the continent. So um, this text addressed to African leaders seems to me be relatively consensual. Uh, we are not calling for a world revolution. On the contrary, we are calling for a collective awareness of the gravity of the situation. Okay, so uh, so, so um, what's been the response? Um, I, I've I've certainly seen uh, a lot of different media have picked this up. Uh, it's been widely circulated, but has there been any response from 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 the governments, the states that you are uh, uh, allegedly uh, referring your your letter to? Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go. So um, the, the, the response has been, has been overwhelmingly encouraging. Uh, we've received uh, responses from colleagues from all over the continent. And like uh, 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 Lionel has just explained, we've heard from colleagues from, um, from, from the four main um, uh, uh, linguistic uh, um, regions of the continent and, and also obviously from outside of the, the continent. We've also heard in private messages from a, a number of people from, from religious circle, from government circle. So the response has been overwhelmingly uh, positive. We could not have, have imagined that this, this would be the kind of response that the, the declaration would inspire. And it seems to me that there is a, a hunger for a space for open debate about some of the most acute questions that the, the continent of Africa is grappling with. So to me, this is the kind of the most important lesson to, to draw from, from this particular exercise. I mean, it's, it's written very well, I think, and, and uh, the language of it is, 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 is beautiful. Uh, you state, uh, like a tech, Tonic storm, the COVID-19 pandemic threatens to shatter the foundations of states and institutions whose profound failings have been ignored for far too long. Uh, alors, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire? What is, what is that? Uh, uh, what do you mean by that, that beautiful statement? Well... There are some people who say that this uh, virus is a democratic virus. That means it affects everybody. But we don't think that it, it is a democratic virus because it's a virus which exposes the um, failing of um, our states. Uh, as I may said, we received a number of responses from people. And when we published this letter, there was um, a, um, uh, an intellectual from uh, uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Cong Congo. Uh, she works in chemistry, but uh, she is also um, uh, she is also on the ground working with people in the North Kivu. And she was telling us that uh, in North Kivu uh, there was no um, ventilator. You see, so people are exposed to many kind of uh, pandemics: Ebola, uh, the COVID nineteen. And there is no state there. So they welcomed our declaration saying that, yeah, you are right. If we take our case in North Kivu, you are right. We see no states here. And we have to um, find uh, alternative ways among ourselves to try to, to help people. So this virus has exposed the failings of our states. And our states have discovered that there is something called the informal sector. Because for six decades, uh, the type of economic policies, social policies, public policies we have uh, had been targeted mostly to 20% of the whole population. Now they discover that there is this informal sector. They could not uh, uh, handle them properly because they lacked the in instruments. And those kind of uh, failings have been revealed by the virus. 
it, it seems to me that 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 that's a really important point that that although it the the virus can affect anyone of any class the consequences of infection are is not democratic at all uh and 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 that for me raises this question about the 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 I mean, it's perhaps unfair to put it this way, but I, I, I get frustrated by the fact that our governments uh, just simply take formulae from, from the North and apply it to, to, to our, our countries. For example, if you look at the principal components of uh, uh, the, the, the public health message that uh, is put out, is washing hands uh, with soap and using alcohol. Now, for the middle classes, that that of course that's 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 natural. You just turn the tap. For most people who live in the ghettos of our of our cities, it it's not uh, it's not a practical thing. But worse still is the um, uh, assumption of social distancing, and and looking across the continent, it seems to me that social distancing is being interpreted whether intentionally or not, as being a way of protecting the, 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 the middle classes and elite from the riffraff who live in the ghettos. Uh, and, and it is used as a repressive way with, with uh, the militarization of the streets and the uh, uh, implementation of, of curfews <laughs> as, as if the as if the uh, uh, virus doesn't trans transmit at night, only during the daytime. I mean, it, it's, uh, so what are the consequences of uh, this kind of policy in terms of the future that they try to be built by our states? Are they now using this as an opportunity to, to strengthen uh, undemocratic and despotic rule? Lionel, um, I'm, I'm, I'm apologize uh, for for my 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 poor English, but I think that uh, the the response of this question is very is very complex and it varies between areas. Um, in, in Francophone country, some country in, in, in Francophone country, I think that those what we call couvre-feu will lead to restrain some um, fundamental rights uh, of people. And the, the, the aim, I think, is not to protect people, but just to, to, to um, assimilate the protection of people with some um, um, foreign or, 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 or extra objective of protection, and which is security you know, and control of population. This is why what I think for Francophone Africa, I, I don't know exactly what happened in Anglophone or Lusophone part. I heard uh, at the, uh, the radio that, for, for example, in South Africa, uh, South, South Africa in, in Cape Town face, I think, um, uh, strong issues with, with um, underclasses and uh, some, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, some kind of popular revolt. Uh, hunger revolt. So um, there is a confusion uh, between the objectives of security and the objective of protect people. And this confusion uh, uh, comes from uh, what I call the, the, the impossibility of thinking about African legal subject. This is a, 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 a theme um, uh, which was already um, treated by uh, uh, Taiwo Olufemi, the professor Taiwo Olufemi. And I, and I think now uh, we, we are 
facing this problem. So, um, would, would, would one of your others also like to comment on that? I mean, the race the, the, in, in, in other parts of, of Africa, we're seeing in Kenya, for example, strong militarization uh, of the streets, uh, attacks against, uh, I mean, in, in, in some cases, you know, in some days, more people get killed by the police than are by, by, by COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in South Africa, you see not only these protests, but you are seeing a systematic attack and burning down and demolishing of the uh, shack settler, uh, settlements, uh, both in Cape Town, in Durban, uh, and elsewhere. Um, so, so the state seems to be taking advantage of the situation for creating the world that they want, uh, which is an expression of, of the elite's desires to see the world in their image. Do you not think? Um, I mean, I would, yes, I, I would totally support that. And if I remember, so um, a week before the lockdown in South Africa, on the radio, all you could hear was people say, um, it is inevitable that we have a lockdown. So they, they, they were suggesting, and, and, and here I mean the uh, middle class was on the radio, on air saying the president has to, has to basically lock them in um, because, because God knows if we have um, a large infection in a place like uh, uh, um, Alex, Alexandra, um, um, Alexandra Township or Soweto, God knows what is going to happen. So um, they were um, telling the government implicitly what policy to adopt as a way of containing the virus. So the, the pandemic is very political. It may not discriminate among people when it comes to infection, but from the way it's been contained, from the way that people can have access to treatment or not, everything about it is political. So it, it lays bare, it amplifies, it magnifies the, the, the disparities, the, the hierarchies um, that exist in our societies. Mm -hmm. And so our governments have not already been very careful about um, the plight of the poor, and this is why in our declaration we called for an empathetic, a compassionate type of government. And so if there is a, a reform to, um, to, to, to implement in the future, we'll have to do rethinking, um, like Lionel just said, the, the, the status of the African legal subject. What does it mean to be an African citizen, to have a care to have a state that care for you, a state that is not extroverted, is not is not just there to look after the private um, um, the the private things of private actors, but is acting is um, um, actively invested in the well-being in the welfare of its people. So so if we are calling for any new form of state, it is a state that is more caring, more compassionate, more more present. In the lives of people, but, but but not just present in a violent mode where it comes to to repress, comes to hate people, but it's there to actually recognize that um, these the the life of these people matter. It's not a matter of of classes or who can pay for decent living. And I think th this is really the this is the major major challenge of a lot of African states, particularly in those societies that are that are very hierarchized, very um, are faced with a lot of um, 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 e economic disparity. I, I think there's a really important point. I mean, there is an irony in the fact, is there not, that actually in most countries that that, that where the pandemic has begun to, to grow, there is evidence that this is being imported into those countries by the middle classes who travel, who are coming from Europe, who are coming from the U.S., uh, and under those circumstances, uh, it is is an assumption that those the dispossessed are the ones who are infected, and they are the ones who are being punished by the lockdown, by the militarization of those uh, of those streets. So, so yeah, okay. So, so some people talk about this as being not necessarily intended, but the consequence of the policies that the governments are talking about 
is a eugenicist policy. It's de facto eugenic. What's your view of that? Well, um, I think the kind of responses the government um, may have uh, uh, is different from one country to another. It depends because not all African countries implemented uh, lockdowns. Uh, for example, uh, in Senegal, there's a curfew, but there is no lockdown. Uh, in Benin, the president said, yeah, we, don't, we can't afford a lockdown. We have no financial means, so we can't afford a lockdown. But uh, be it militarized or not, the thing is that uh, there could be no, let's say, humanistic response to this pandemic. Uh, because uh, if the economy is not working, uh, people will die uh, out of hunger. People will die out of other, other diseases. People could die out of promiscuity, etc. Uh, so whatever their, their response, uh, the fact is that uh, they never cared about uh, what is called the informal sector. More or less 80% of the pop population in most countries in Africa. So even if they had this generosity towards the informal sector, they lack the tools. For example, if you want to uh, distribute uh, food aid, how can how are you going to proceed? Because uh, our governments never had this, uh, let's say, this policy of distributing food aid to, to, to the poor. So how, how are they going to proceed? In Senegal, we see, for example, that uh, even in the distribution of this food aid, there are many cases of um, corruption uh, uh, where, let's say, people close to the president are involved, you see. So whatever the response, uh, it's not a progressive response. It's not a humanistic response. So that means that we have to um, uh, change the, the type of public policies we have, but also the type of, of state we have. Uh, as my colleague said, we have to um, create, transform the state to have a state that cares for its um, own citizen. But we know this, this will be a, a challenge uh, because the uh, old reflexes of the elites are still the same. So we could expect that after the pandemic, if there is not a strong push from below, uh, yeah, the weight of inertia will still be there. Um, one of the things that um, several people that we've interviewed in these series of uh, 40 or so uh, interviews, a recurring theme is that what the uh, what the virus has done is help lift the veil from our eyes. It's not creating a new situation. It's revealing the, the, the disparities, the inequalities, the, the, uh, the, the uh, major differences and, and weaknesses in our societies. Uh, is that a view that you would share on 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 uh, uh, the, the the nature of that? I mean, I would say that is only true for for those who who live in bubbles. But for for um for um anyone who cared to pay attention, you would have noticed uh, it's. I mean, it is the thing is is in your face. Particularly, I mean, so I I, I live in Johannesburg. It is in a it is a very um, um, rough place to be because you can't avoid um seeing the thing i mean and you know and and the thing mean the the, the shocking economic disparity among people the ge the geographical um segregation of living etc etc and this is at a global scale now we are noticing so perhaps in in north america and western europe they're only noticing these things because they are they are um, faced with an um, over overwhelming health threat that has crippled the health services in some places. So they are uh, experiencing a, a, a tiny bit of the thing that we experience every day on the continent. So it, it does not reveal anything new. It is just that every 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 tragedy um, comes with um, with um, it's like a. I mean, it, 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 it can jolt us into action because of the, the need to just rethink the, the, the fundamentals of things. So in that, in that, in that sense, it is, almost, it is always um, a good thing to, 
to 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 um, to pause and think about the, the significance of this particular moment, and that's really what what we're also trying to do with this letter. It is not to say this is um, a groundbreaking, a world shattering event, but maybe um, it is. It could be if we want it, but in the in a in a good sense. Okay, um, one of the things you say in uh, in in the uh, declaration. Um, which is, is in a sense a reflection of this thing that this virus is helping us see things more clearly. But you 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 make a, a or you imply a, a very uh, significant critique of Pan-Africanism. Uh, what is this uh, this um, pandemic revealing about uh, Pan-Africanism, uh, Lionel? Uh, is, si tu veux, tu peux par parler en, en, en français. On, on va traduire, ou peut-être Ami uh, va m'aider de de, 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 de de le traduire. Of course. Euh, sur la question, sur, sur, sur la question du du panafricanisme, ce que cette crise révèle c'est l'abandon de l'idéologie panafricaniste depuis plusieurs années. Je ne parle pas de l'incantation. On peut parler de panafricain, tout le monde peut se dire panafricain, mais le contenu du projet panafricain, le contenu politique du projet panafricain semble être à l'abandon. Et c'est ce que... Attends, attends. Amy, euh, tu peux se faire un sommaire Oh, OK. So, um, he just said that um, what the crisis might have revealed is that pan-Africanism as a, as a, as a um, political uh, a project has been abandoned. And he doesn't speak about the, the, the declarative, declarative, discursive type of pan-Africanism that is just branded about as an ideal, but an actual um, political program. Alors, vas-y, Lionel. Et, et je crois que ce projet panafricain est abandonné parce que nous n'avons, nous sommes dans une situation compliquée où nous n'avons plus de leaders autant progressistes que nous avions aux indépendances. And it has been abandoned because we no longer have those um, uh, uh, forward-looking progressive leaders that we had in, in the 1960s. Ce qui fait que le panafricanisme a, a laissé place à une forme d'impérialisme néolibéral et on, on ne pense que par l'économie, l'économie et l'économie. So panafricanism has given way to a form of neo-imperial um, kind of governance and we can only, we have been obsessed with the um, economic um, endeavor and have let everything else fall by the wayside. Hmm. Le développement et le développement aussi qui, si, si même je reprends les, les catégories de quelqu'un comme Frédéric Cooper, sont une autre manière de prolonger une pensée néocoloniale. Mais j'arrête là. <laughs> so, without wanting to go um, too far into this um, concept of um, uh, um, development, if we, if we um, read somebody like uh, Fred Cooper, Um, um, it is a continuation of imperial colonial design in a way, but it is perhaps a different discussion for a different day. Alors, uh, in, in, in that situation, uh, you talk about uh, Africa seizing its own de destiny, that it must... Uh, Uh, take its destiny into its own hands. Kiska Savadi, what does that mean, taking the, our destiny uh, into our hands? Uh, Dongo? Yeah, if you see the um, multilateral order is breaking down under our very eyes, you see. And um, that means that uh, if we have to tackle the current challenges, we have to tackle them by relying on our own forces we could no longer depend on others because others are uh, busy uh, 
tackling the pandemics or they don't want to help us. So that means we have to find the means to um, take back our own destiny into our hands. And that is the original, let's say, uh, idea behind the Pan-Africanist project. Because the Pan-Africanist project was a project to liberate African man, African woman from oppression, from inequality, from, from also um, diverse form of exploitation, neoliberalism, colonialism, etc. That was the initial um, idea behind Pan-Africanism. That means together as Africans, we are going to, to, to uh, tackle together our main issues. But the type of Pan-Africanism we have is a Pan-Africanism that is only oriented towards liberating markets. Uh, more trade for goods, more trade for services, more financial liberalization, etc. That's what has been achieved more or less under Pan-Africanism. That means uh, an agenda which suits the IMF, which suits the World Bank, the WTO, and all the major powers. That's what has been achieved. And this is Afro-liberalism. It's not Pan-Africanism. And um, we have uh, to go back to the initial idea of Pan-Africanism to tackle together our challenges for example, we know that Malaya uh, kills uh, uh, many Africans every year. Why don't we have, let's say, um, uh, an approach, a Pan-Africanist approach to tackle this disease? There are many other diseases. Why, why, why did we have to wait until this COVID-19 to say that now we have to have an African response? We need this African response beyond it, before. Uh, we need to have an African response regarding, uh, let's say, infrastructures. We need uh, an African uh, response rega regarding the monetary system. We need to have our, let's say, uh, own monet of international monetary fund, an African monetary fund. We, we need to have uh, such kind of initiatives. But we don't have a kind of uh, Pan-Africanist approach which is um, aiming at solving the challenges we have. And that is what is sad. And now, uh, as the world order is um, breaking, uh, yeah, we have to rely on our forces, African forces. So we no longer have the choice. We have to do it or we'll die. That's the issue. Uh, I, I I, just, I, yes, please, I Amy. Mean. I mean, if I could just add to that. So, so many, so many people are trying to, to make us believe that um, um, there is a new world order that is being shaped before our very eyes. But what is really happening is a c continuation of the geopolitical tussle in which we've always just been a, a minor, marginal um, actor, if you want. So um, now is the time, more than ever, for Africa to take um, its, its own um, destiny in hands. But it has to start with owning an African narrative. And everybody, I know everybody says that this, but this is really important. And I think this is also one thing that we wanted to uh, signal in our letter is it would be nice to have, to go back to, to a moment where we have a Dakar school of thought, a Bansalam school of thought, um, all, all kinds of new thinking emerging from different corners of the continent to rethink the, the, the basics of the African state, the basics of um, economic independence, the basics of the, the ways in which Africa has been historically integrated and how it should be integrated into the, um, the global um, economy and not let others yet again define for Africa a path for the future. So I think it's, you know, as you have seen, there are lots of people now being, be, being busy also um, um, making a plan, an exit plan for Africa, um, so to speak, um, the, the debt, um, um, debate has been um, in in the headlines, and I think it is also part of that very bad habit that the West has of of just um, uh, deciding for for Africa what it should do and how it should do it. I mean that's an interesting point because one one of the th things that you culminate your 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 declaration with. Uh, is not so much an appeal to the African governments you're writing to, but but to your colleagues. You you, you talk about uh, the the need for uh, um, the restoration of its intellectual freedom and capacity to create. Um, but but we have these 
these institutions. I mean, there are the 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 a, a, a academic world in in uh, in in Africa. Uh, they are the uh, Pan African institutions like Codestria. There are regional ones that that have emerged. Um, what's happening? Why? Why do we need to appeal for the restoration if if these bodies uh, are are not the ones that we ourselves helped create? Uh, are are not net or perhaps? Do you think they are not necessarily doing what we need to have done? Uh, Lionel, tu, tu, tu... <laughs> c'est une question peut-être un peu difficile, mais, mais vas-y. This is, a very huge, this is a very huge question, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't want to, to embarrass colleagues, uh, African colleagues, uh, but uh, okay. uh, um, I think that the, the, the problem is that in my point of view that the institutions like for example Codestria doesn't don't, don't do not have a, a kind of space to discuss with our political leaders. Uh, but also there is a problem to, to to draw a kind of circulation between the, the works uh, in social science doing by uh, African academics in the continent and in diaspora and the, 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 the political field. I think, yes, this is uh, the problem, but there are also um, other pro pro problems. Um, and um, maybe I, I will say it in, in, in French because it, it's a bit complex. Uh, Um, uh, le premier problème, c'est la gouvernance, en tout cas pour ce qui concerne les, les francophones, c'est la gouvernance des universités qui, en fait, les, les universités francophones, de mon point de vue, ne sont pas encore décolonisées. Ami So, um, c'est the most um, acute problem, to be a problem of, of, of manage management of particularly Francophone universities that in his view are, are no way being close to de decolonize. Et puis, et puis, il y, y a un second problème qui concerne la, la, la bureaucratisation des instances comme le Codesbria qui ne permet pas, à mon avis, une... Euh, d'ouvrir, à mon avis, un, un espace suffisamment critique qui, qui, qui pèse sur les décisions politiques. Euh, il y a eu, mais il faudrait que le Colisoria fasse aussi son, sa, sa propre autocritique, euh, mais je pense qu'il y a ce point-là aussi de, de gouvernance bu, bu, bureaucratique et, et, et néo-managériale qui empêche aussi d'exprimer une pensée diverse et plurielle. <laughs> so he, he doesn't want to get in trouble <laughs> by saying too much, but he thinks that um, institutions like um, uh, um, are too steep in some kind of a managerial uh, governance system, which is very um, bureaucratic, makes little space for, for, for ideas. And, um, but he thinks that it, 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 is, it is up to Kodesria to make its, its own kind of self Um, kind of a, have its, its reflexive moment. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I'm reminded, I, I used to work, uh, I spent a year working at Codestria, and I remember having dinner with, uh, with Samir Amin one evening, uh, and I was explaining to him, uh, c'est vraiment bureaucratique, huh? it's very bureaucratic, and I said, uh, c'était uh, Napoleonic, Uh, and he looked at me, he said, no, 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 Napoleon était efficace. 
No, Napoleon was efficient. <laughs> uh, so it was, it's, but I, but I, but I, you know, it's true that you know uh, there are lots of pressures on these different organizations, especially the with their Pan African, and having to depend on aid and so on uh, to come in. But it, it seems to me. Let me pose this as a question: Is it because they they are bureaucratic, because you know procedures etc. are needed for transparency? Or is it that that our institutions, not just cadastra, but academic institutions, yeah. have become disconnected from the project of of emancipation? Mm -hmm. Rather, because it seems to me to me to, to be a, a political problem rather than a, a, a managerial one. Dongo, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think I, I I would share that kind of uh, point of view. We see that there is a disconnect between, let's say, research and public policy. Now we are facing a major crisis. For example, we would have liked uh, institutions like Codesia or other to provide us with, uh, let's say, guidance on specific issues about debt, what we have to do, about monetary integration, about trade integration, about many other issues. But we do not see such institutions producing this kind of reports. So. We are, we are obliged to rely on reports coming from abroad or reports coming from, let's say, United Nations uh, institutions, etc. Uh, for example, about debt here in Africa, we just saw the report by, um, by the UNCTAD and also by the Economic Commission for Africa, but nothing from, let's say, uh, many think tanks in, in, in Africa here. And it's sad. And the point is also that this disconnect could be somehow linked to the fact that the university, uh, the academia has been, uh, let's say, um, contaminated by neoliberal type of thinking uh, in, the, in their curricula and uh, also in the, um, let's say, in the way people see themselves. Because before we used to have, um, let's say, thinkers which were activists at the same time. So they linked their, their research, they linked their thinking to practical things. But now we see people are mostly uh, interested by their academic career and so on. And you would see that um, in many, uh, many, many, many institutions. And that's explained somehow uh, why uh, these institutions are more and more disconnected with what is happening around. And it's a very uh, tragic situation. And I think, as Ami said earlier, we have to try to build schools, uh, African schools. Uh, when I say African schools, uh, that means uh, uh, original African thinking. We have many uh, uh, creative thinkers around the world, in the continent, in the, in the diaspora. Uh, but the point is that they are not really connected. And I think with the kind of declaration we did, uh, we hope that it will be possible to bridge, let's say, uh, to create a bridge between all these creative thinkers, be between all those um, people uh, from the academia and uh, from uh, the other places who uh, believe that it's possible to have uh, an original thinking about Africa and that this thinking be uh, useful for public policies for transformation. So, yes, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, just to add to what Dongo's just said, I think we, we missed a chance many, many years ago to think an African university for um, African um, uh, societies. Um, the African, you know, the typical African university is a continuation of a colonial uh, um, institution that was supposed to service a particular kind of bureaucracy. That hasn't really changed. We do not really think about the kind of skills we are, we are, inculcating the kind of the kind of African citizen we we are um, shaping in, in those universities. I think um, now is really one of those times to to also rethink mm. the, the the place of a university, particularly of the African university in an African um, context. Just one comment. I mean the, one of I think one of the inheritances of our colonial past or colonial present uh, to be more accurate is that uh, there is this separation that, that it is for intellectuals to do the thinking uh, and for the masses to uh, follow their line. 
but should we not be thinking about what does it take to to have a respect and accept that people do think that that emancipatory politics is dependent on a, a recognition that the masses are capable of thinking and and that actually intellectuals have become disarticulated from their political base all of us owe our our education to sacrifices made by our people uh, and and you know to quote uh uh, uh cabral uh, is this not time to return to the source uh perhaps give you a, each an opportunity to react to that uh Lionel um, yes and I, I think it is a, it is a big challenge for us for academics to rethink to rebuild a kind of epistemology which could make the link between the mass and what we call the the elites and also to rebuild some link between the common common sense of thinking in, in, in the mass and to translate it in academic way. This is this is a big task. Some colleagues try to think about that. I think that there are some some works, some papers. Um, also this leads I think to what all we know of decolonizing university, what happened in South Africa. But I don't know where South, where South Africans are now, but uh, uh, um, I think this is a, a big challenge and maybe uh, it will lead to, to, to not to think in academic institution, to rethink academic institution, you know, uh, uh, yes. Um, final words uh, on that point. Uh, Ami, do you want to go next? Um, I mean, just, just by, I mean, I was just um, listening to what uh, um, uh, Lionel was, was saying. So in, in the past few days and weeks, we've seen that there have been um, a, a, a medicinal uh, um, uh, medicinal uh, solutions, uh, African medicinal solution uh, to the um, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, problem that have been this easily, I mean, quickly, that, that were quickly dismissed by the so-called uh, uh, um, elite. And I think it is a reflection of the d disconnect that my colleagues have been um, uh, uh, discussing. And um, so we will have to return to African knowledge uh, practices, African medicinal practices, if we are to actually uh, make the kind of transformation that we suggest in the in the in the in the letter. I think the problem of the uh, um, intellectual elite is the same as the um, political elite, which is. It is um, extroverted, disconnected. It is part of a global elite that um, kind of navigates and uh, um, operate in the same sphere and um, has very little to say when it comes to what we call the masses. There's no such thing as the, the masses. There is a society or there mm -hmm. are societies to be built and that's where we, where we have to apply our minds, in my view. Don't go. Yeah, I, I would say that, especially in the Frankfurt sphere, uh, if you see uh, the leading thinkers, they are not thinking Africa. 
they are thinking, let's say Africa is a pretext for thinking, but they are not really thinking Africa. So um, people use the continents to develop a certain kind of narrative discourses, but they are not really interested in uh, having a genuine knowledge of Africa and having this uh, connection uh, with, with the masses, with, with ordinary people. So we have to change that. But as I um, was said uh, uh, earlier, uh, this is a kind of uh, mirroring um, uh, the legacy of colonialism. Because as we have this uh, division between citizens and subject, we have the same thing in the, let's say, in the knowledge sphere between those who know and the masses who, are, who people who pretend to know say that they know anything. And we have to, uh, let's say, interact more with ordinary people to uh, associate with them to, uh, to change things, also to um, develop new kind of uh, theoretical frameworks. Because without our masses, we could not help or we could not aspire to, uh, to, um, to have a decent understanding of what is going on in the, in, in the continent. For example, you could not uh, have an adequate, let's say, housing policies, I don't know, social protection policies, if you do not talk with uh, most of the African population, those who are uh, uh, in the informal sector, for example. So we need uh, this, um, uh, this connection. But to do that, we have to um, break with our old colonial habits, uh, which are still uh, in us. Well, uh, this has been a, a, a really, really interesting discussion. And, and I'd like to thank uh, each of you for uh, your, your time and also your thoughts. Uh, and, and I think, uh, I hope at least that it will help uh, uh, some discussions to take place uh, and people to reflect on the issues that you raised in uh, the declaration. I, I should also thank you, all three of you, for taking the lead in putting together and, and getting so much support for, for this declaration. I think it is exactly the kind of initiatives that we need to see much more of uh, as a way of beginning to help us reflect uh, on our destiny and the possibilities of our uh, taking control of our destiny. I, I would be remiss also not to thank uh, the GOAT who has participated uh, voluntarily in this discussion <laughs> and, and, and is clearly expressing great applause to, to Ndongo's uh, contributions. <laughs> so, uh, with that, I would just like to thank each of you, uh, Ami, Lionel, and Dongo, uh, merci, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to have you uh, on this show. Um, I will send you the link to the to the show where you can uh, you can embarrass yourselves with what you said. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I'm I'm sure this I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in this. So so thank you so much for for joining us. Perhaps. Uh, and want to say goodbye to you for the moment and look forward to being Thank in touch you. again. Thank you, Rosie, for having us. <laughs> okay. Dongo, goodbye. Lionel, goodbye. Ami, Bye. goodbye. And, uh, uh, and see you soon. Okay. All the best. Uh, thank you for joining us today on uh, organizing in the time of COVID and the reflections on the declaration that was made by uh, African intellectuals on the topic of uh, COVID. I uh, strongly recommend that you you have a look at this being published in various places. Uh, here on Al Jazeera, for example, uh, is the uh, declaration fully um, uh, reproduced as it is uh, on our own website uh, with, uh, with this video. Um, we are uh, going to be uh, signing off. I'm going to be signing off in a moment, but just to say that in uh, in half an hour, I will be uh, talking with uh, Yao Graham from Third World Network uh, in uh, in Ghana to reflect on on issues which are parallel uh, um, reflections on the 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 challenges that we mm -hmm. face. Uh, 
uh, as, as seen from um, from uh, Ghana. So I hope you will join us uh, then. Thank you for, for participating today and uh, keep well. Uh, this is Feroz Manji signing off uh, for now.